Brennan. An administrative investigation is underway, but she assures the public that DYA's priority, most of the time anyway, is the safety and well-being of their youth residents. Uh, she adds the subject of this investigation will not have further contact with residents. Bree, we were looking at the court documents for this, and this is that one where she had also said to this 12-year-old, do you want to try me? It, it was, I remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Senator Chris Duenas is here. He's a former DYA uh, director. Uh, Senator, this is the, you know, and I don't know if it's like the age of this uh, individual. I mean, this is nothing that will excuse this behavior. But, you know, when you work in this type of field, you got to have a thick skin, right? Yeah. Good morning, Chris and good morning. Jason. And definitely, it takes a special person to work at, at the Department of Youth Affairs and you know, one one of the most uh, uh, su- the most success that I had in hiring youth service workers was those who had uh, been uh, AmeriCorps volunteers. And the reason why is, um, you know, the AmeriCorps is a wonderful program, and um, it gives young people an opportunity to get credit towards uh, college and, and and a small stipend to help. Many government agencies like agriculture and others have that program and those individuals really just fall in love with the job. You know, it, the, the job chose them almost, you know, kind of like one of your former broadcasters, right? That's out now I know and doing great work uh, to try to help children, particularly I, I think uh, some of those who are uh, either abused or, or having, uh, you know, uh, needing uh, shelter and the like, but yeah, the. I always pray whenever I sign the DG1, you know, to bring somebody on board, that the job chose that person. And by and large, that is the truth. Um, but you do get individuals uh, that are there for the wrong reason. And uh, I had, uh, um, you know, in the seven and a half years that I was there, I had uh, a couple of incidents such as this. And uh, I can say that during my time, um, after the investigation, everything was completed. Um, those those individuals no longer work at the Department of Youth Affairs. Mm. Yeah, this just kind of seems like, uh, well, I mean, it's very hard to read, uh, especially considering that these are troubled youth, right? Uh, you know, I got a 12-year-old, <clears throat> and I wouldn't know what to do if some adult was, or punched him in the nose, right? I mean, even if he was uh, in a D-Way. Do you think the charges should have been more uh, serious here, uh, Senator? It was um, assault by a peace officer is a third degree felony. Yeah, I, you know, I, I I'll have to take another uh, look at it. Um, I, I, you know, I can't say right off the bat. I know that, I know that the charges that were brought against a couple of individuals that uh, that did that during my tenure were were quite serious. Uh, so, but. Um, I mean, a felony is a felony, right? I'm, you know, you know what's frustrating, Chris and Bree, is that, and I used to get really frustrated about it. Is Department of Youth Affairs has a lot of resources to be able to, uh, you know, handle these kind of situations. Counseling case management is one of the strongest. In fact, I really, I, I this is one of the areas where I complimented the governor. I was not surprised when Department of Youth Affairs was tapped to deal with the overwhelming caseload at. Um, at public health uh, when the uh, issues were there that this just was uh, basically out of control, if you will, in terms of managing, processing those uh, uh, cases, uh, complaints, uh, uh, you know, of abuse. Uh, and the reason why is the counseling case management team really is, is the backbone of Department of Youth Affairs. They are the, you know, they are the ones who really keep the uh, youth centers open and operating. And, you know, the youth centers are designed for youth to come in and and uh, you know, participate in, in programs, uh, assisting them with GD preparation, um, you know, just social interactions within the community, right? But the real reason for those uh, centers is counseling case management, managing children in the community when they have um, you know done their time at youth affairs, uh, whether it be as a status or non-status offender. But that's where they kind of go to to reinforce, you know, uh, trying to stay out of trouble. And it's court ordered a lot of times for several months, up to a year really, uh, or, or more sometimes, depending on what the situation is with the with the child, right? But um, that is really, uh, if you go to any one of those centers and 
you know, you see the, um, the, the, the senior social worker there. Um, those are our lifers. I, I, I think all three centers, uh, maybe with the exception of Dededo, have the same person than when I was there, and that's wow. almost 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so that that coupled with, uh, I think they still receive services from, uh, 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 what do you call it? That, um, uh, we have, when I was there, I brought on board a staff psychologist, Juan Rapatos, and I think he still does uh, services up, up there, but they really have, uh, uh, Carlos Titano as well, they really have a really strong, um, you know, group of individuals and case management is something that's taken very seriously at the Department of Youth Affairs. And so it's really kind of uncalled for anytime you have a situation like this, an individual should not have to resort uh, to that type of, of situation because the resources are there. Um, I'm sure it's just as strong, if not stronger than when I was there. Uh, and uh, there, there's no excuse for this. You can immediately call, uh, you know, on the social workers and everything else. You can have that child uh, removed. You can have that child brought into, uh, you know, a, a counseling session uh, with multiple individuals, multiple disciplines. And uh, so it's one of the reasons I had no problem signing termination papers because there's just no excuse for this. Yeah, there shouldn't be yeah. excuse for it anyways. Yeah. But I'm saying uh, if everything is, and I believe it is the same as when I was there, there's just no reason because there's a lot of resources to take care of a child who's acting out. Okay, what's up with the silencer uh, bill, right? Uh, so the debate's been pretty pretty juicy. Yeah, you know, and Chris, I mean, I, I get it. You know, mo most people, uh, the nomenclature that they know is it's a silencer. But the truth is it's a suppressor. Um, if uh, some senators did go over the weekend up to uh, one of the ranges and they had a chance to, you know, experience uh, what a suppressor really does. Mm -hmm. uh, it really reduces by, I think, 30 to 50 decibels the, you know, impact of firearm noise. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it in the bill, it calls for abiding by all federal laws. So it's, you really can get in really big trouble uh, if you use a suppressor for the wrong reason. Um, it takes about eight months to get one in terms of the application process because they're strictly regulated. Um, simply put, like my good friend, uh, Senator Adams said, if it, criminals don't care about the law. You know, if criminals want to get their hand on something, they're going to get, they're going to steal it they're going to make a crude device uh, to suppress sound. So I feel for law abiding citizens, um, law enforcement individuals, uh, whether they're active or retired or military, who firearms is a part of what they do. It's, it's their everyday job. I sit on the floor, you know, I, I have a really close relative of mine that I spend a lot of time with. Um, that Now it's not because of uh, gunfire, but uh, he works uh, in, a, in another environment where machinery, heavy machinery is constantly running. And um, his situation with uh, his tinnitus and uh, the ear, it's, ear issues are really, it's, it's become debilitating. I mean, it's a life-changing experience when, when you lose this, uh, any type of sense of hearing. And so um, I really think that it's, the bill is written strong enough in the laws of Guam uh, you actually, if you go through the sections of what's required, you, you have to be a licensed firearm owner in order to be able to purchase it. So it's basically a mirror to our gun laws, which are very strict. I think Guam is very, we're very fortunate here to have gun laws that are, that are very uh, strict and licensure and, and, and the like. So I, I hope people can understand um, what, what the bill is trying to do. But I'm not going to say that I don't understand concerns. I mean, that yeah. that would just be crazy for me to outright say uh, that you know that that there shouldn't be some concerns. But I I think um, you look on the national level and the like. There's been a movement to kind of uh, bring about a better understanding of why suppressors are used and what their intended purpose is. Yeah, and so, it really so. is for individuals who have to consistently. Uh, use their firearms uh, for their as part of their their job. So, in its simplest form, this bill allows those who are registered um, 
firearm owners to be able to do purchase uh, silencers or suppressors or whatever? Yeah, you can go to Kmart and pick one off the shelf. Um, you know what I mean? And, 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 and go home and use it or use it, you know, for whatever reason you're going to use it for. It's very strictly related. I mean, I regulate it. Um, it, it, they have serial numbers. They have, uh, you know, they, they're, they're, like I said, even just the application process, it, it takes up to eight months and that's stateside uh, to be able to obtain a suppressor. Uh, and, it, and it essentially is treated uh, as, as really an extension of the firearm. Mm -hmm. So all the uh, laws and all the prosecution capability with regard to if you use it uh, for a, um, a reason to uh, commit a crime or, or do damage, you know, to, to anyone, and uh, you know, it, it, you you face if the long arm of the law reaches out and grabs you, you face some really really tough, um, you know, uh, penalties. And those are I, I I also said this on the floor. I, I believe that if there was any in, in other jurisdictions, there there are cases of this. I mean, ATF gets involved. Um, when you when when you use you know uh, these type of devices for any so you really you're not just facing law and local law enforcement a lot of times you're you're facing federal um, you know charges and so uh, it's very serious and um, uh, I just hope that we can continue to assuage uh, the public that this bill is not designed to uh, in any way make it easier for. Uh, anyone to use a firearm and, and disguise is really truly designed for those um, either gun enthusiasts to really really um, you know practice their their art uh, if you will of make, being proficient with their firearm or those who absolutely have to do it because it's part of their job and if you go into the committee report uh, there was uh, I think one or two individuals that were expressing concerns but the large majority uh, were individuals, retired military, active military, uh, police officers, and you really see some really good testimony in terms of what it's all about and, and why um, the community who, uh, who is uh, really uh, um, you know, uh, active with firearms are advocating for this because it, it really is uh, an extension of part of their protective gear as far as the way they look at it. Yeah. Uh, no, I wanted to switch to. No, I just would. We had a comment uh, here. Um, with all that the island is going through right now, this gun law is not important. Um, Senator, this, how would you kind of react to that? Because, I mean, people are kind of saying that, I guess. I mean, I'm not saying that you can't ever work on any bill that isn't, you know, about COVID or whatever, but just how do you kind of address th that concern? You know, I, I, I can understand that, you know, that, that that's fair criticism. I, I, I know in the past when, uh, you know, bills have been introduced to ban plastic bags, do certain things where people are just like, what? You know, I get it. The thing is, is that, you know, I, I like the part about with all that's going on nationally and locally, you know, the elephant in the room really is crime. Crime is up all over the place. You have um, in the cities, in the states, I'll be honest with you, there's certain places I used to go visit, I don't even wanna go anymore. I just, I wanna see certain family in some places in the states. Um, Guam's violent crime also is, is, is really on the rise. And I would kind of differ with that a little bit, saying that firearm purchases have been increasing because people are taking more into account their own public safety. And those that will be going to the range, I, I know a couple of recent individuals who recently acquired a firearm and have gone to the range to be able to um, make sure that they understand how to use it. They were amazed at the uh, kickback and the noise associated uh, with using a firearm. And uh, <laughs> they, they, they would like the range to have that option for them to use when they go and practice. So. I, I would kind of differ with all that's going on because truthfully, unfortunately, our island as well as our nation and our world is, is becoming a way more violent place uh, to live. And it's, it's not just firearms. I mean, it's, you see stabbings, you see all kinds of crazy stuff, particularly on the national scene. But, um, you know, you see a lot of, uh, lately you see issues with 
high speed chases and you know the drug problem and everything else, uh, murders and things that are going on. Um, you know, a, a while back, right, Chris and Bree, people were probably wouldn't have even been, um, you know, too keen on Castle Doctrine. But now we've seen cases where those individuals who are protecting their home and their business and their life, that they probably would have been drugged through the courts. I mean, think about that guy with his barbershop, you know, with his wife in the room. And uh, he took the law into his hands because he knew he could. Either he probably would have maybe made a decision not to shoot, or if he did shoot during that time, uh, he probably would have been facing a lot of charges and legal fees and everything else to prove that he was defending himself. But the Castle Doctrine, I think, has helped a lot of us where people know now, I, I better not go in that house, or if I do, I better expect that if I don't come out, that individual is not going to be too worried about, you know, prosecution. Mm. So right. some yeah, of these yeah. things take a little while, I think, to come online. And, and yes, there are more pressing matters. As a matter of fact, I'm going to move for the override of Bill 11 because I think the governor has really been taking way too much liberties with uh, this, um, you know, public health emergency. I know that there's a lot of people that are really, really upset about the mandates. The other night we had a marathon a hearing. Uh, and while not huge in number, the passionate testimony from mm -hmm. people who are otherwise taking care of themselves and have reasons for why they're not getting a shot are very angry that their livelihood and uh, particularly teachers, people who take care of our children and have done it all their life, that their livelihood has been stripped from them. Uh, if you see on the national scene, uh, the president, President Biden is get either his mandates are being stayed or just ruled outright unconstitutional. And so you see a lot of situations whereby, um, you know, this abuse of powers is something that is, uh, is, is really uh, unacceptable, uh, particularly nationally and, and locally, I think, too. Uh, on November 23rd, Hawaii uh, lifted all, most if not all, of their restrictions, declaring that they're open for business. I believe they are no longer in a public health emergency. And 20 months is just too long. Enough is enough. And it, and, and, you're, and that that you know that commenter is correct. There is a lot more stuff to do. One of the bills we're entertaining right now, Chris and Bree, is on sole source procurement. Why do we have to go and introduce so many bills to try to make sure that we're restricting the executive's power? Because there has been a lack of transparency. There's been a lack of coming forward to say, this is why we're doing this. And so some of my coworkers there, you know, on the floor said to me, hey, you know, I, I think the better way than Bill 11 is to just keep introducing these bills that provide for reports and you know change procurement and all this stuff and I, I don't I don't fault them for that but I'm like yeah but you know are we closing the barn door and the horses have already you know or the kabod or whatever else ran away already and so you know I, I just I think that um, you know uh, the, the people of Guam are right to say there's so many things we need to do and uh, from time to time there are bills that don't look as important as other things, but we're doing a lot of work uh, to try to improve people's lives, to hold this government accountable uh, and, and to account for, you know, the resources. You know, another bill I heard you talking the other day on this, Chris, you know, I, I, I'm i going to make a lot of noise about it during the Committee of the Whole, but I'm, I'm disgusted that the legislature has to pass a bill to match the ARP you know, for the tourist industries. You know, these tourist industry owners, these, these people that have been here, their whole life, their whole family, everything's been invested in this island. Most of those you know, people have been doing business for over 40 years, and they're holding on by a thread right now. And they have, like you said, Chris, they have to beg for money when there's a whole bank full of money and we have to play this game where the legislature needs to, you know, appropriate 25 million to match the governor's 25 million. I don't even know if Gita right now is is going ahead and rolling out the program while they wait for the, you know, uh, the governor's 25 million. You know, I know we're in the season of Advent and maybe I should, you know, 
be a little bit more generous. But, you know, our Lord also, you know, when we read the Bible, there's a lot of accountability in there, and that's what we have to do. But uh, rest assured, for the people of Guam that are watching now, um, I'm working every day to try to improve your lives. I'm working every day to make sure that our island and our businesses can stay alive. That's why I'm advocating for ending this public health emergency, open up Guam. You know, the governor has the power in the drop of a hat to do what she needs to do. She's declared that this entire bank account loaded with cash is hers. She can respond to any emergency with that cash. I've not seen proven anywhere that it requires an emergency to spend money the way it's being spent. And, uh, and, and that's what we would ask for when the governor has to come down every 30 days to explain to the legislature why the public health emergency is necessary to continue. But I hope 10 of my colleagues or nine of my colleagues would join me in saying, no more and uh, override Bill 11 and have more accountability in our government. But those are just some of the things that many of us are working on and many of us in the minority are very united on these issues. Well, yeah, you said in the minority, but we're talking about a Democrat majority in the legislature. And uh, right. I know you, you said you were disgusted um, that the legislature has to come up with a $25 million match for the LEAP program. But in reality, it just seems like, well, you can be disgusted, but at the end of the day, that thing is going to go through. And I'm really surprised that it hasn't even been brought up when you do have these businesses out there that need help. And do you know if it's actually going to be discussed on the floor today? Uh, that bill is on for discussion. I believe it's right after the current bill that we're discussing. Right now we are on the uh, opioid settlement uh, bill. The Attorney General's office is, is there testifying uh, in favor of a bill that creates a, mm -hmm. a basically a commission to uh, make recommendations to administer this settlement funds when they arrive on Guam. But I believe the next bill up is the LEAP bill. And, uh, and you're right, Sabrina, it, it, it is a Democrat majority, but a lot of Democrat colleagues are not happy with this too. Uh, and I think you're going to see that on the floor. A lot of Democrat colleagues are not happy. Uh, I know I, I don't want to speak for her, but I think I've heard her in interviews. The speaker is not happy with this. Mm -hmm. She really is asking straight away, where, where, where's, where's the money? And even if you look at the BBMR's, you know, testimony on the bill, I, I was I was getting a, a I was a little surprised with Lester because it almost sounded like he was talking about the money wouldn't necessarily be there because he went through the commitments that are already tied to the $62 million, um, unaudited $62 million uh, surplus from last year. And uh, you know, the last fiscal year. So he went down the line and came up with about 9 million there. Uh, even though we're tracking this year, you can't spend any of that money. And so really one of the reasons why Senator Frank Bloss and I and Tony Ada introduced a, a bill to give the governor some additional transfer authority. I know some folks have been upset about that, but really that's the only place that the governor can find the money is within the budget. And it just seems unreal, right? I mean, when you have 550 some million dollars sitting there, why, why would you even tinker with your general fund appropriations? You don't even know if they're gonna be adequate to finish the year. Um, and, and so, yeah, uh, Bree, there are Democrats that don't like this either. So LEAP might not even be discussed for another two days, possibly? If well, it's going to be discussed in this session, and I believe the bill will pass. But I think most people are going to pass the bill holding their nose because all they can do, what, why do we want to show the business community that we're not behind them? We're actually more behind them. We want the governor to use all ARP for this program and get it moving now. And so, you know, uh, I, I saw an article in the paper uh, the other day from a former colleague of ours, Jesse Luhan, writing that, well, I don't know why, you know, <laughs> the governor, you know, Governor Gutierrez is, 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 is the one really champing at the bit to get things moving. Uh, in several interviews, has said, you know, I just hope this, uh, they don't try with this omnivirant or whatever else it is to, uh, Omicron variant to, to you know, uh, shut our butts down again, you know, and, 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 and yeah, of course we have to take everything serious, but we have to move too when it's not serious and, 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 you know, and keep the bus moving. So, uh, yeah, 
Um, I, I, it, it will be heard. I believe it will pass, maybe unanimously, but we're going to do it because we're going to show good faith to the businesses. I, I know a lot of these businesses that have come forth to testify to you guys, you know, they're, they're, being, they're playing nice because they have to. They're, yeah. they're on their last leg and yeah. they probably know it would be better to just get it straight away from ARP, but hey, pass the bill, the legislature's involved too, we're helping. Okay, I mean, I'm going to vote for it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I have to to show good faith. Right. Right. But that, you but have no choice. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> I mean you're for your backs against the wall and you're actually... And the businesses you, aren't going to go challenge the administration. Of course not. So we're yeah. actually doing the wrong thing be, for the wrong reasons. When we know that there's a right thing to do, but we're just not going to do it because the governor's forcing this. So I, I don't know if this is even a win. Anyway. Yeah, um, anyway. We wish you luck. Yeah. Connor. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no. Good luck with that, man. <laughs> hey, maybe we'll maybe we'll ask for another, you know, to, to take Santamina and Kamalin around again <laughs> in one more time, and right. we'll all just continue to pray our rosary and 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 what it is. But yeah, it's it's a tough road, and but I I, I continue to remain proud of this legislature. You know, two two of my colleagues have joined me to pass Bill 11 and also to override Bill 11. So if we get two more. We're going to continue to show the governor that you know we're not we're not sitting on our hands that mm -hmm. we're on it and and we're doing our job and you know when the governor goes to Washington and says you know my senators <laughs> no we're the senators for the people of Guam we don't belong to any administration but you know when 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 that when the contempt is shown consistently this legislature has to stand up all the time and say no our job is to keep the check and balance it's not personal you know we can hang out at the fiesta open up Guam and we'll hang out at the Christmas party together. But when it's time to do the job, we got to do the job. Thank you, Senator. I uh, will see you in the session. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe we could get a little Christmas caroling. we got to go to the top of the hour, <laughs> uh, Senator. Good enough. If I don't see you before Christmas, Merry Christmas to you and the people of Guam. I'm pretty Merry sure Christmas. we'll see you before Christmas. Merry Christmas. All right. Uh, hey, it's 8 o'clock. On the breeze side, we are KUAM-FM, Agatni Guam, and KUAM-TV. Here we come. Good morning.